Listening to The Starting Zone, a podcast about World of Warcraft and the people who play it. And now, here are your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to The Starting Zone, the podcast about World of Warcraft and people who play it. Today is September 23rd, and my name is Spencer Downey. Thank you so much for subscribing and listening to our podcast. I'm joined today, as always, by my co-host, Jason Lucas. Jason, how are you doing on this fine Monday? Spencer, hello. I am doing uh, quite well. We are we are actually really all the way into uh, season one now, aren't we? we? Are. It it took about a month, uh, you know, to get it all the way out. But uh, I think you know the slow burn worked out pretty well. I think it was nice to have all that extra time with early access, as controversial as that was at, at the exact moment in time. But having all that extra time to just kind of experience what the expansion had to offer, do all the kind of outdoor content, more casual stuff, level up tunes, and then, you know, just kind of ease into it. I think that worked out really well for me. So I don't, I'm, I'm glad that they did it that way. And, but now all that's out the window because, you know, we're into season one and that means like, okay, I got to pick and choose like who I can spend time playing this week or whatever. I'm, I'm not leveling anybody else at, at the moment <laughs> is what I'm saying. I already have more tunes than I can manage at, at max level at the moment. So but that's cool because it's not going to stay that way forever, right? Out of the gate, it's just like, okay, full raid schedule, keys whenever you can get them in. Got to prioritize those those tier eight delves on the main. Yep. All that stuff takes time, you know, and I only have so much time to play. So, yep. you know, I think being able to level tunes easily and have all these kind of you know, systems to support moving stuff between characters or whatever is amazing, and it's going to pay dividends forever at this point. But, um, man, for the next couple of weeks, months, probably, it's just full steam ahead on the Warrior, I think. Yeah, I almost wish that there was a way. You know, I, I know I know there's no way to feed uh, vault loot to alts in that sense or, or to each other or bounce it around or anything like that because you just end up in a situation where people are playing a bunch of characters to feed one character to make that character stronger. But I almost wish there was an option to like, if you got a piece of loot and you chose to drop it by one entire track, you could then send it as a warbound item to one of your characters. Like it became a warbound thing. If you dropped it by an entire track, that would be interesting to me. That would be kind of cool. Right? Yeah. Because then, then it's a situation where you're not, you know, necessarily feeding your main character at the beginning of a season, all this crazy loot. Cause you've done all this stuff on your alts. It, it would be very unlikely that you'd be playing all these characters doing high enough content that you were then able to drop the, the, the rewards by an entire track and send it over to your your main character and still have that character get this huge benefit from it. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I wish there was something like that because I'm with you that like I, I enjoy playing alts. I, I leveled another character this week. Um, so unlike you, I was still doing that. So I have three now. Um, my mage is now max level. I did that. actually finished that today, uh, earlier today. And that character is tailoring enchanting. And so... That character had a lot of fun actually leveling up through creating things because the the nice thing about professions in this expansion, the, the, there's not a lot of nice things, but there is a nice thing about professions in this expansion, uh, and that is that if you max out a character or, or start, start leveling a character and hit 70 and get into the new expansion, you can immediately go around and gather all the treasures, and that's a lot of knowledge points. You can then go around, if you have your renown high enough, and buy all the renown booklets which is also a lot of knowledge points. And then as you're crafting the new things, you get enough of the actual currency to go to the Crafters Guild and buy the books from the Crafters Guild for at least the first book or so for each of those. And that's even more knowledge as well. And then, of course, you're getting all the knowledge from just actually crafting new things the whole time. So you can actually get pretty deep into a profession pretty quickly, and you earn experience every time you craft something so I actually leveled from 70 to 75 just crafting things, which was really interesting that's to me. That's cool. So Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was it was kind of a neat a neat way to level a character and I I enjoyed that and then from 75 up I just started doing world quests because the other thing I was doing with alts is basically going, "All right, once I've gotten my alts to the point where world quests are no longer really a thing outside of like the keystone fragments or maybe valor stones depending on where that character's at as far as valor stones go, I'm then like, "Okay, well my mage who's my newest character, is now just, and also is a uh, uh, enchanter slash tailor, 
is now just doing all of my world quests for me whenever they come up. They just clear the map because they'll disenchant any greens and whatnot they get that they can't use. And every time they're killing something, they have a chance of getting cloth. So then they get more cloth. So then they're able to craft more things. Whereas my alchemist, herbalist, and my jewel crafter miner really don't benefit from going out and doing those sorts of things other than they pick up nodes when they're on the map and they're going to do stuff. But I like doing dedicated gathering runs when I'm doing gathering runs because I drink one of the perception files that's out there so I can see all the camouflage nodes. If people aren't doing that, by the way, it like doubles the amount of nodes that you find. <laughs> it's incredibly worthwhile to get those, those files, even if you just get the rank ones. Um, they give you a whole bunch of perception, which helps you get the higher end material, higher end goods that you're gathering, while at the same time also revealing all those camouflage nodes. So definitely worthwhile getting those. Uh, but yeah, in general, I think this has been a pretty great week. Uh, this week kicked off for me with, I guess, I guess the last time we talked was before we did our raid last week. So, or did our, our last raid day last week, last Monday. So we did not get Queen down on Heroic. We did get Silken Court. So we are... Uh, Eight of eight normal, seven of eight heroic. Last night we went in and cleared all of normal and up to queen again. So we're now seven of eight heroic again. So tonight we'll raid with a full raid night just to spend on heroic queen and hopefully get her down in the first half of the raid. We only raid for three hours. And then we are also doing prep for the first three bosses on mythic. So we'll probably knock those out as soon as we can as well uh, so that we start getting some of those mythic pieces inside of our great vaults as well, which would be great and sort of help the team progress along. It's going really well. I did uh, did Boomy still primarily as my main, although last night we had a healer out, so I was healing the back half of Heroic, and Rest of Druid is not in a great place, I have to say. Uh, there is definitely some, um, some areas where it can shine, but as soon as you put, uh, you know, Evokers and Holy Priests and Paladins and Resto Shamans next to a resto druid you immediately see the shortcomings between the two so it's an interesting thing to be like oh okay i understand why they buffed them last week and i understand why four percent wasn't enough and they need more so hopefully we see some of that come in for them as well uh, i know boomkin is in a slightly better place we still have a lot of outliers happening there enhancement shaman is massively performing ahead of other classes at the moment which is really interesting to see uh, we still have Hunters and Warriors at the top, which I don't think is a bad thing. Arcane Mage is still performing really well. So we're starting to get that, like, Hunters, Warriors, and Arcane Mage just kind of float together to a certain degree. Enhancement Shamans are out front by, like, 30%, it feels like, most of the time. And then Boomy's somewhere below that. Um, rogues also perform really high up there. A certain, it depends on how well the Rogue player is, but they also are, are hitting up pretty high with the Warriors and whatnot. So good to see the class balance coming into play. Our locks have been doing okay as well. So I, I feel like there's just a couple outliers that they need to trim back, and hopefully that happens over the next week. We did have some hot fixes come in today, so we'll talk about those later in the show. But yeah, raid was a lot of fun. And uh, how was your raid time this past week? Or at least you well, was really good. Yeah, Are you done it. Are you uh, done week now? Um, now? Yeah, well, our week is yeah. finished. Yeah. Um, finished up last night. Uh, you know, I, one of the biggest challenges that I'm having with raid at the moment is just juggling the roster. It's tough. Mm. You know, I have I'm getting 36 plus signups Holy for every raid man. night. Yeah. And um, I got a couple people that just have sort of voluntarily benched themselves, or at least like one or two guys I, I, I can think of off the top of my head. They're like, hey, listen, I don't really need spots right now. I'll just, you know, I'll let you know, Yeah. which I, I really appreciate. And some people have been cool about, like, I'm just going to bench myself for normal night or whatever. So right. that helps. You know, I, like I have eight healers in rotation, so I'm like Oof. bringing six and, you yeah. know, benching two. Or yeah. one of them has pretty much just been, uh, you know, uh, voluntarily benched um, so far. So it's a process, you know, it's uh, it's something I'm not really used to dealing with as like the raid leader. And so I've, I've kind of taken a different approach to it. What I what I do is I get on everybody's case about signing up, you know, for the events, the events post right after raids finish for the yeah. following week. And then like Friday afternoon, Friday evening, there's like a comp tool that we have in the ZTH discord. So I can I, I get like a little table and I can pull everybody who signed up into the table and set up my comps and set up who's going to be benched or whatever. Right. So I've been using that to just like get out in front of it. Like, listen, here's who I'm bringing for normal and for heroic. If you need invites, like check the community calendar uh, last, you know, they, they do like a Sunday afternoon kind of casual run in ZTH. They had to split it into two pretty much full raids yesterday and they both full cleared. So, um, 
you know, we have plenty of options for, for my my overflow, which is nice. Because in the past, it used to be like, well, you can't raid with us this week, so good luck pugging, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to just communicate, you know, I think that's the key to avoiding kind of friction. Um, and obviously, people are going to be disappointed if they get set out, but it's there's just nothing I can do about it. I can't bend the rules of the game. I can't bring more well, than 30 people. So Yeah, and, and, in, and in a week or two, you're going to start finding that there's more and more people who can sit because they just don't need the gear off of certain bosses anymore. So there's yeah. at least that consideration that can start happening. It'd be almost interesting to see what a sign-up looked like, not just for raid night, but was for, like, tier bosses or for mm -hmm. whatever it was, right? And so you start going, okay, like, I know that there's only 17 people who need this tier boss. So these 17 people are in and then what do we need to sort of fill out the rest of it? Like that, that would be an interesting sort of way to start figuring yeah. that out to a certain degree. It's, it's more finite detail, but yeah. Cause as soon as people start getting those key pieces, you start just asking the question of who can sit and you're like, Oh, there's like tw 10 people who want to sit for this. Right. Boss now. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I mean, I think, you know, interest is also going to tail off a bit and we'll be pr probably under that 30 cap before too much longer, but you know, it's cool having everybody back and, and raiding with the big group is, is fun. And we haven't really been super punished for it at this point. Um, good. Yeah. The boss, you know, Tuesday, the, the raid is really good at flex. I have found that there has not been yeah. too many bosses and mechanics where like, dude, if we drop this whole raid down to 14 people, this boss would just fall over so easily. Right. right? Like there's right. been very few it, of those. Yeah. I haven't felt it really at all yet. I mean, a, 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 we started feeling a little bit on Nexus princess, yep. but, um, that's the one that yeah, that's about of. it so far. Um, so yeah, Tuesday, you know, we started with normal, we busted it out in just slightly over an hour. I want to say nice. A and then uh, I only had it like, I only had Tuesday set up for normal because I'm bringing, I'm rotating people between normal and heroic and whatever. I yeah. didn't want to start the heroic ID without the people I said I was going to bring. So somebody floated the idea like, hey, let's do Black Temple. And I said, oh, that's actually a great idea. We can actually finish that around the end of our scheduled raid time anyway. So we just went and did Black Temple time walking with the full group. Took like 40 minutes flat yeah. maybe. So yeah, yeah like, like two hours we were done with Palace and Normal and with Black Temple. That's a ton of gear going out to the team. So that was awesome. Yeah, let's, let me highlight that for a second because I don't yeah, know how many people sure. jumped in on that. But the, the time walking last week was great. So on Tuesday, similar thing for me, I hopped on my main, I picked up the quest inside of Dornagal for completing time walking the, the five boss kills either inside the raid or in dungeons. I went to Shatrath, I picked up the quest that was there. The quest that was there was to reward you a 610 piece or heroic level piece from burning crusade loot raids. Uh, so basically you're like, oh, okay. So if I do time walking Black Temple, I get normal raid gear from that raid and I get the piece of normal raid gear for, for killing five bosses from the current raid and I get one piece of 610 from the raids from Burning Crusade expansion. It was really lucrative for loot. It was certainly a great thing to see. I want to highlight this more when you go into the next time walking event that we have going on that people should be taking advantage of this sort of thing because it was really nice for that. Now I got, I got a ring off of uh, at a Serpent Shrine Cavern that was like a thousand haste and 3,500 versatility. And I was like, this is a great prot warrior ring. Like, what, what, it's terrible on my druid right now, unless I'm doing uh, doing guardian stuff. But yeah, you, you, it's, it really is rolling the dice since it's such a massive thing. But there are people out there who got like 610 weapons or got, you know, really nice trinket or got things like that that could actually help them out in certain cases with their gearing. So time walking was a big thing to hit up. I definitely will highlight it more during the, uh, the next go around, but I did it on both my Druid and my monk. If I can fit it in today and there's a run going, I might try and fit it in on my mage too. Uh, it is, it is worthwhile doing whenever those come up. And yeah, it took me 45 minutes, took you 40 minutes. It, it was a great way to spend the time. Yeah. It's amazing early in the season. And I mean, this was a change that came in. I want to say dragon flight season three, maybe it was a little earlier, a little later, but where, the event quest to kill the end boss of the time walking raid is up every single time the event rolls around. Like it didn't used to be that way. It was like a one time thing ever. Yeah. And then they changed it. And then suddenly early season time walking raid became a whole different thing. So yeah, yeah, that was really cool. And it was, it, it was also nice to be able to bring some of the people I had to bench for Wednesday into black temple just to get more right. loot and get that six ten piece or whatever. So that was cool. You know, heroic reclear went, 
pretty well. You know, we didn't really, really have any big problems getting back up to, you know, Nexus Princess was our next target. We had a little bit of time to look at it by the end of Tuesday or Wednesday. And it was going OK. Um, some people were clearly not really getting the memo about the strat we were doing mm. and um, where the portals had to go. So you didn't get sucked into oblivion. Yeah. Or just like how to react to like when you're the target of the laser beam that's going to move the portal. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, people were just kind of slow in the uptake and like not really hanging out where they needed to with the orbs and the orbs going through the group is a big problem, too. So we kept kind of. We'd lose like a third of the raid early on, and then we'd lose mm. the second third of the raid, you know, uh, later on. So like and, beams and, then, and dodging the, the yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then by the end of the raid, it's like, you know, the tanks and, and some of the sturdy DPS. And, you know, we're like, okay, here's how it all looks, you know. I picked it up Sunday, and I think we we downed it with the full group or or maybe 29. I had 29 or 30 in for the kill. The kill was like super clean. And I think it only took us about an an hour, maybe, maybe not even. So that was cool. Moving to five of eight heroic after two resets yeah. was nice. And then we had plenty of time on Brood Twister. Um, we oh, didn't so quite you get went, there. You went Nexus Prince before Ovenax. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I was just going by like WoW progress kill stats, and Nexus Princess seemed to be yeah. a bit more killed, and it seemed like a quicker thing to learn, maybe. So it is I a think it paid off. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't feel too bad at all. So, yeah, Brew Twister, like, we had a couple pulls where people were dialed in and just broke the eggs in the right sequence, and we got pretty far into it. Um, we had a bunch of pulls where people were just kind of freewheeling, like, hey, yep. I got the egg break circle. I'm just going to go over here. There's an egg here. It, the fight is so much easier when you have, like, a plan for where you're going to break the eggs and when. Or at and least, what combos of ads you're going to end up with. Yeah, as you say, or at least if people are breaking eggs towards where the boss is charged so they're not becoming too many empowered ads. Or, like you said, you're not getting, like, three worms on different random areas of the room that people right, have to try and travel to. they're all 80 yards apart. Exactly, yeah. 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 So, you know, we just need some more practice with that. That's I was really micromanaging it a bit. I got to the point of, like, okay, after we move, uh, you know, areas of the room, I'm going to redo the ground marks and everything. Like, your ground marks are going to match up yeah. with your DBM yeah. spam and all that. I think that helped a little bit. It's a lot of information for people to process at once, but... It's not one of those fights where you can just say, okay, the eight people that know how to do mechanics are going to handle this and you just stay alive. Like, it doesn't work like yeah. that, yeah. right? Like, no. everybody needs to know the plan and, and know, like, okay, which ones are breaking next? Like, what does what's the combo look like and what do I need to pay attention to once they break? So, yeah. Yeah. just need some more practice on that. I'm not, I, I, I mean, it feels eminently doable, but, uh, you know, we just, we, we need some more pulls. The, the, I think this week we're going to do normal one more time, full clear, get the skip unlocked. Yeah. And then we'll, you know, we'll just do like Anseric kills to probably start the week. And then we, we're going to be much more in prog mode after this coming week. Yeah, the, the thing about Ovenax that I wanted to highlight there is the nicest thing about that boss is it does get dramatically easier with gear. It is one of those bosses where it's not, you know, oh my goodness, this mechanic's going to totally wipe us every single time when someone screws it up. Because worst case scenario, you get an empowered ad. And as long as you have enough damage, you can just blow that thing up so quickly that it's not that big of a deal. Like we got an empowered worm. We just kept it interrupted and killed it as range. And it was, you know, dead within eight seconds. And you're like, okay, not a big deal. We handled it. Move on. Next thing. That's what I like about that is it, it does feel like a boss that as though, it's, although it's mechanically challenging early on, as you gear up your raid team, it will get substantially easier because things will just die a lot faster and you'll have more time to move things around. And you won't even get to the point where like the room's starting to fill up with darkness and you got to kind of deal with that. Like you'll just kill the boss too quickly. So I think on normal, we killed the boss before we moved to the second cluster of eggs. Like we just did the first one and then killed the boss. <laughs> it was really weird. Mm -hmm. So damn it, like damage and gear will dramatically help on that one, which is good. Yeah, there's a thing with I do have like one minor concern about like the overall tuning of normal raid, which is I feel like it's almost too easy because I don't think it's going to provide us much good practice, you know, for these mm. later bosses. They die so fast on, yeah. on normal to with the amount of damage and stuff that our core team can can put out for like doing normal raid even two weeks in. It's like, OK, well, the boss died before anything dangerous happened, so. You know, I guess we'll see what it looks like when we start progging heroic. Yeah, yeah. So, there, there what, is I mean, that. 
in a way, it's like a good problem to have because it's fun and it's very time efficient. It's cool to kill a boss super quick and get loot out and go on to the next thing. So, you know, we'll get there. But yeah, raid so far, I mean, I think this is one of the best intro raids they've done in a really long time. Like, I do think normal should be easy. It should be accessible. It's supposed to be, you know, friends and family kind of oriented. It should be a thing that a team like that can clear. I think it is that certainly. And uh, yeah, I mean, two weeks in, I'm, I'm feeling really good about where it landed and um, you know, we're looking forward to working on uh, some more new bosses. Hopefully we'll get brood twister down before too long this week and maybe start working on silken court. You know, I think it's possible with where we landed and with another week of like big upgrades for everybody yeah. from great ball and yeah. reclears and stuff. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the funny thing for me so I, I obviously ran on my main. I hopped into a pug normal on my monk. It was me uh, on my monk. There was our, our resto shaman for our team was playing on his holy paladin. And then there were three of, of our other DPS on their alts. And we all joined, first of all, one pug group. And basically the, the four of them got in and then they re recommended I join. So I came in on my monk. And within about, I want to say, 20 seconds of me being pulled in, I was booted from the group and then the person who recommended me was booted from the group. So then the other three just left and we're like, I don't get it. I don't know what that person's problem was, but apparently they didn't like a monk coming in. They're like, no monks. That's not allowed. Uh, I don't know. It was weird. So I was like, all right, fine. So we just joined another, another normal pug. We went seven of eight uh, normal before we, as, as a group left, um, we did like four or five pulls on, on queen before it was like, okay, well, we may eventually get there, but I don't want to be here in here for another hour and a half trying to work on this. Like we're good. Uh, we did like one of our DPS got a spy masters out of that. Uh, I ended up getting the, the jewel crafting recipe for crafting sockets. Like there's a bunch of stuff that was really nice that nice, we got out of that. Cool. So yeah, there was some nice to grab from that. There was some great things we got out of the normal from that, that people were enjoying, but I do feel like it's one of those raids that I think is well tuned, as you said, for like a friends and family style raid team to sort of get in there and be able to actually realistically clear the place. I do feel like heroic scales dramatically in those last two bosses. I think Silken Court gets a lot more difficult than the previous two bosses. And I feel like Queen is like 20 or 30% more difficult than Silken Court. And I think that is something that you notice with, uh, with, with the raid a lot. So I, I do feel like a lot of heroic teams are going to hit a wall and that wall is going to be essentially uh, Ovenax first and foremost, and then they'll go to Silken Court, and that'll be a wall for a period of time. And then they'll go to Queen, and that'll be a wall for a period of time. So I think those last three are going to be struggling that way. And I think they'll be curious to see what it's like in Mythic, because I got a look at Mythic Silken Court as some of the teams were pulling it on stream earlier this morning. <laughs> and the added mechanics, you're like, great, there's just like another split your raid into two teams. There's different colored orbs. If someone doesn't get an orb, it wipes the raid. Halandra style craziness. And you're like, great, okay. This is okay. So this is going to be even more difficult and challenging on Good times. Yep. Look, uh, looking forward to that down the line at some point. So yeah, I, uh, I, I think the raids in a, in a really good spot. I'm really happy with it. I'm glad it's going well for folks. So yeah. in a couple of weeks, yeah. we're going to have the, uh, zone wide buff start stacking up as you kill bosses in there for the weekly quest too. So, mm. um, you know, I think that it, that's going to smooth stuff out on top of gear acquisition. We're probably what, like two weeks away from that starting. It's not going to start this week, but pretty soon. And, uh, I, that's really going to help teams get over the hump, I think, you know, so that's cool. I mean, I, I think, it, it's, I think it just landed in a great place, you know, really. This is what this is what the player base, I think, really needed or uh, even if they didn't want it out of the first uh, raid tier of this expansion. Because if we ended up in a situation where everybody was just... I mean, I remember like when Hor this is going way back, but remember when like Horadon came out and Throne of Thunder and everybody yep. was just stuck on that yep. boss and it's like the second boss of the raid. We want to do this, and, but uh, we and can't what, kill Horadon. So and what was after Horadon? The turtle boss, soccer boss. You had to kick the shell into <laughs> yeah, the turtle. Like, yeah, right. And it was again another one of those. Oh, hey, if you don't have a good person who can cook the sh kick the shell, then you're just stuck. So yeah, that was yeah. yeah. There's nothing like that in here, and I mean, in th Throne was a great raid, but like uh, you know. I think, for, and it wasn't an intro raid either, but for, for first tier, man, this is this is almost like Nax 80 kind of feeling for me, you know? It's just like, all right, come yeah, on, good. come on in, let's kill stuff, you know? And that's that's yeah. the way it should be. So I'm I'm thrilled and I'm looking forward to getting back in there this week for sure. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it too. Okay, Mythic Plus also was something that kicked off this past week that we all sort of dove into and had a good time with. And so I recognize the front of the show is going to be a bit longer with recap, but we do have a bunch of tail end stuff we're going to cover as well. So it's going to be another one of those meteor episodes. So Mythic Plus wise this past week, 
Uh, I did break 2K. I was uh, 2043 or something like that that I ended up with for the end of the week. So I want to get my heroic piece. So I was doing sevens and eights and nines kind of idea as far as keystones go. I will say that was entirely not doable with random pugs. You had to do that with like a coordinated group that had certain people inside of the group to sort of make sure that you were performing the roles you needed to perform. We had the Aphix this past week that spawned in orbs that had to be CC'd a certain way. So even making sure you take the talents to handle that, that was Ascendant was what that Aphix was in case people are curious as the bargain was Ascendant. And that's where these orbs spawned and you had to disrupt them in some way, whether that's a stun or an interrupt or a knockback uh, to, or purge them to actually make them pop. And then you got a bunch of haste out of that and movement speed out of that, which was great. But it meant that like, oh, hey, Typhoon is really strong. Actually, my favorite thing for orbs this past week, which I want to highlight, was my monk dropping Ring of Peace. Because you drop Ring of Peace and then every orb that spawns gets broken immediately. Like it, it literally spawns into the Ring yeah. of Peace. The Ring of Peace pops it and you just you, you don't have to wait for all 10 to spawn. You can just be like, oh, they're spawning there. Ring of Peace. All right. Doing something else right. now. Don't need to focus on that anymore. <laughs> That was they really seem to spawn nice. like in the radius that's like the same size as Ring of Peace, yeah. so, and Ring of Peace lasts for a few seconds. So yep. yeah, as they all spawn in, they just get popped. Yeah, that was that was wonderful. I can actually do stuff about uh, about this bargain, which is fantastic because see all of the episodes where I was complaining about incorporeal and afflicted. Yeah. Um, it is very visually noisy, right? There's a ton of plates that pop up while this is going out. Yeah. But um, yeah, you can break with almost anything. Intimidating shout is one of my favorite tools because it's just an AOE fear bomb. So it'll break as many of them as I can get in range of, or if somebody else, you know, doesn't beat me to breaking them all. I think shockwave and, you know, was the other one. People yeah, were using shockwave a lot. breaks yeah. a ton of them. And yeah. I also got, you know, I have a storm bolt that hits three targets now. So yeah. you, sometimes you get those last two that spawn in late and I'm moving away from them or whatever. Just storm bolt them. It feels so good. Yeah. And the buff is really nice. I mean, if you, you know, when you break them all, it's it's like a mini hero or whatever. So, you know, it's, it, it is a bit uh, visually noisy, but um, there, you know, there's nothing else cluttering up the battlefield, right? It's just that you're just doing the, the regular stuff you do in the dungeon. And then there's that thing that happens. So I, I thought it was good. I, I, I liked it a lot better than some of the affixes we got new in, in Dragonflight. It felt pretty counterplayable to me. Yeah. I will say an interesting thing that, that happened this past week is a lot of people were trying to build their routes was running Necrotic Wake and Mists of Tirnasyth with the bizarre percentage that they were requiring people to kill trash wise because it you you have to pull a lot more. I, I don't know what they changed or why they changed it, but both in Necrotic Wake and in Mist of Scythe, I think it's almost 20% or 30% more trash that you have to pull to actually complete those, which felt really, it just felt weird to be in there doing that and, and knowing that I needed to do that. And there was also a lot of hotfixes that came in to try and balance some of this stuff. One of the big ones that happened to me early in the week twice uh, was the hook throw for the third boss inside of Necrotic Wake hitting one of the orbs affixes that spawned in so it couldn't hit the boss because it would literally surround the ad. And as you like threw your Typhoon, one more would spawn and then the hook would go out and hit that and you just couldn't actually get the boss back down off the stage. That was really unfortunate. And so that got hot fixed later in the week, thankfully, uh, that they actually registered that was happening because a lot of people were complaining about it. So that was really good. Another weird one for me was on uh, Rashanon inside of Dawnbreaker, the, the certain abilities can't actually target the boss because the boss is on that slope, which means there's no path available for you to actually cast something on them. I, not a lot of spells are affected this way, but I know um, the orbital strike thing for, uh, for Boomkins wouldn't target it at all because it would just literally say no path available over and over again, which was really sad because it's a big DPS cooldown. So not being able to cast that's unfortunate, but there's little things like that that still need to get sort of tuned out and fixed up. I will say for those running running dungeons out there, if you turn on static flight before doing Dawnbreaker, you will be a very happy camper. You have massively increased flight speed and it makes everything absolutely like nullified in difficulty for flying around to stuff. The, the, there's no like physics trying to push you back when you're flying from one ship to the next there's no like you literally have static flight on so if you're going to do dawnbreaker just try on static flight before you do it and you'll have you'll be flying essentially as fast if not faster than the dynamic flying mounts without any ease, difficulty at all so that's uh that's a nice little tip for folks wanting to do that
Yeah, it's like there's some kind of trickery going on with the way you like land on the boats in that dungeon. I who knows I've what they through to the do tech wise to, to make it work. Yeah. yeah, I got I got stuck inside part of the boat uh, once this week, but mm. like it, it it is it's a little weird. But I've gotten kind of used to it. I guess I know what to expect. I don't. I mean, how they made all that stuff actually work and feel playable. I mm-hmm. don't know. It must have been it must have been a uh, a quite a challenge. But um, I think overall, you know. Uh, Mythic Plus feels pretty good. I think we're seeing, you know, maybe some skewed expectations about like how hard the system should be at this point. Um, I had kind of a frustrating week start to the week because I was like rotating people that I was doing keys with quite a bit. And so I ended up just doing so many plus twos because nobody had any keys, right? Like you get a plus two, that's what you have. And so I was pushing up so many twos into fours and fives and then people wouldn't know how a boss mechanic worked and then they would become a four or three and then we'd start the process over. Um, So, and I didn't also like, I just had stuff going on and I didn't have as much time to do keys as I kind of would have liked. I still did a ton of keys, but I didn't, I didn't have as much time to play as I wanted to, but Yesterday, I ended up getting like 800 rating in basically a sitting. So that was pretty good. I'm, nice. you know, I'm up over like 1800. So I hadn't even there. done like Necrotic Wake. I hadn't done uh, Grim Batol until yesterday, right? So like I said, gaps. So now I've done them all. I've, I've kind of, I've done them all in at least like a five, you know? So I have like a decent idea of what the bosses look like and stuff. And I mean, there are, you know, I think there are some that feel way harder than others, like Grimatol is a good example. There's a few bosses in Grimatol yeah. that are the, 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 are unforgiving. The, the second to last boss and the last boss are very unforgiving fights. Mm-hmm. And, and, and duo boss in Stone Vault was one I got stuck on with a group on a plus six for quite a while. The, uh, the, the, the duo boss, that's the one you're talking yeah. about, the big cube that moves across the room. Yeah, yeah. The, mm-hmm. the biggest tips for that for folks is always look for the empty vents. The moment the vents start lighting up with fire, look for the empty one, move everything over to that empty vent every single time that happens and honestly it's one of those fights where if you don't have a ranged interrupt it's a lot harder because you have to have a ranged interrupt for the caster when he runs off into the middle of nowhere if you don't have one then you're just going to take a big hit so you have to have your healer ready for that big hit yeah just, just and the, hit, the hit slows you immensely too which yeah. then see also the thing about moving as fast as you can to the safe spot exactly. um yeah. and you got to kill them like basically at the exact same time yeah uh, there's the no forgiveness that, yeah yeah the the buff that the one gets when the other one dies is lethal so yeah yeah they just felt a lot harder than some of the other um the other like similar dungeons at the same difficulty that mm. that i had done so I mean, I expected they're going to tune stuff up, but overall, like, I can't complain too much. You know, I think the system feels pretty good. We, we've had way worse week ones of new Keystone season than than this week in terms of that yeah. that feeling that you're not going to get over the hump, you know? Of course, Tyrannical had to be the early affix because it just always works out that way, which does make it a bit harder, but it's good practice for the bosses. So, you know, I'm looking forward to... to maybe not as many keys as I did this week. Cause I mean, when you're doing twos and plus three in them, it's not a big time investment, right? So the, the volume of keys you're doing stacks up, yeah. but I want to see what the other affixes are like, you know, and, and how we kind of play around them. And I mean, we had, we had a bunch of people in guild and finish KSM this week and everything. So, you know, we got some people and p- plugging away, which is awesome. It's also going to pay big benefits for, uh, for raid nights. Right. I mean, yep. it's just so much gear and, and vault choices and all that. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I thought it was awesome. I, I I might, I think tonight me and some of the crew are going to get in there. So we'll see if we can get anything else done for the week. Maybe get some higher item level out of the vault, you know, something like that. So, um, yeah, I might have one more night of Keystones for the week. And, I yeah, I, I think um, they took a huge gamble, I feel like, with with this restructuring. It's, it is a lot different. And players wanted something different. What players wanted was probably not this like if you ask them like what do you want i don't think that this is what a lot of players who were angling for changes would want but i think in that you know in that two to ten range i think it feels okay so far and obviously there's some dungeon tuning that probably needs to to happen and some bug fixes like some of the ones you highlighted but you know overall I, i i think it landed okay and it has that added benefit of injecting that Zalataf kind of flavor and, and that overarching story into the Keystone. So that's cool. I, I had, I mostly had a good time in there except for the, the sort of frustration of like, okay, well, all we got is twos and threes. All right, let's do something low. Here we go. 
Yeah, I'll say two things on that. For The first is, I feel like if a key is timed and you have a key that's a lower key, you should be able to reroll your key for one below the timed key. So if I have a plus two and I just did a seven, I should be able to talk to the person at the end of the seven and we did that seven in time and get a turn, turn my two into plus six something else. That should be what I'm able to do. That'd be cool. I, yeah, they're a little too precious with the key distribution yeah. still, I think, but you know. Yeah. It only matters this week. It only, ma it only, yeah, as you said, it only really matters this week. I just think it'd be a great way for people to get an actual relevant key early on for something they're doing. If you're in a Mythic Plus and you're able to time it, you should be able to time the one before it, which means that you should be able to take your old key for whatever it is and turn it into something one lower than what you just did. That should be a thing. I just think it's a, a system that I'd love to see them incorporate. So that to me would be great to see. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight uh, as far as Mythic Plus stuff goes is I feel like the system's a great system. I think it came in with people feeling like Mythic, like like the number associated with their Mythic Plus was supposed to be a lower number so it's easier in that sense of like, hey, it's a plus four. This shouldn't be so bad. And you're like, no, no, recognize what a plus four drops at the end recognize what your item level is, recognize what comes out of the vault, all of that was considered when doing tuning for the plus four. So if you are a 585 going into a plus four, you're gonna feel it, it's gonna suck. That's just one of those things, as opposed to it being sort of what it was like previously in Dragonflight and, and you know earlier expansions where it was like, hey, I might be in blues, but I can do a plus three, no problem. That should be easy content and good upgrades for me. Uh, I, I feel like that's that's the something that threw a lot of people off early on was getting too big for the riches, if you will, of being like, yeah, let's, let's, well, I'm going to knock out nines this week. We'll have all nines. I'll be max. I'll max out my vault. We'll get some mythic loot out of this. And you're like, well, are you at least six ten eye level? Cause that's heroic eye level. No, I'm, I'm six Oh two. And you're like, okay, we'll recognize the challenge you're taking on. <laughs> and you might be able to finish a nine. Yeah, it might just bar, take you right? 150 deaths, but you might be able to get there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's roughly equivalent to like a 19, you yeah. know, uh, like I said, I was doing mostly fives, which would have been, 15s, you know, roughly yeah. 15s in the previous season yeah. or well, not previous season and the previous system, I mean to say. Yeah. And like, yeah, it, it feels about on par coming in super low power at the beginning of an expansion. You know, it's not like I'm decked out from the previous season rolling into yeah. like in, when we went from season three to season four, we had this kind of restructuring of the rewards and the difficulty scaling, the numbering and all that. And I was decked out from season three. Season four was tuned pretty easy. Just rolled in there and steamrolled it with all that gear and all the stuff they were giving you. And it felt yeah. great, you know. Now we're all the way back at the bottom of the hill and we got to start building it up again. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm I'm seeing, like, obviously there's there are plenty of people who didn't really play the system in Dragonflight season four. And so these are new changes to them. And also just maybe people who are more casual Keystone players to begin with, who are just kind of checking it out and... You know, a, a plus five might not sound like it's that much harder than a plus two, but the per rank scaling and the different affixes that come in, yep. they ramp that difficulty up really fast, you know? Yeah. The cool thing, I think, if you're more of a casual player, man, uh, like the 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 gear that you get from delves is like so much better than, than mid keys. And it, I think they're easier, you know? I... I did I I did a full slate of delves on the warrior. That was pretty easy. The warrior's up over like six eleven equipped, I think, at this point. So she's just like blasting through. Did them on the monk as well, and that that's feeling pretty good. Monk has some really nice tools for for yeah. solo delves. Yeah. Um, I only got four in on the druid. I just don't have enough time. You know, the fact that I got eight and four on the monk and druid is miraculous. So, hoping for some good stuff out of the vault tomorrow. But like. Dude, what do you got to do to get 616 loot out of the Mythic Plus row? Like sevens and up, I think. I think sevens are 616. Yep. Like I got it for me and for my play style and, and the typical kind of like uh, friends I'm running with. A tier eight delve is much easier than a than a plus seven at the moment. So, you know, it's it's cool. Like, I mean, my my monk is probably going to have heroic two piece uh, after reset this week. The Druid might too. And. You know, the monk's up over 600 eye level. I haven't raided on it. I haven't brought him to any keystones at all. It's, uh, you know, you just slam some delves, man, and those 603s and 610s and your 616 vault choices really add up. So I know, like, the tuning on that has kind of been all over the place, but I think as we start seeing what happens when you start 
tacking on some item level and Bran starts getting some levels, I it's it feels pretty good to me. It it has landed in a great spot for my playstyle. I just don't have enough time to get like twenty four of them in every week right now. Yeah, vault wise, I would certainly say that uh, the delves are the way to go for your vault reward for the week. I mean, I'll highlight that plus sevens, which gets you the six sixteens, drop six tens at the end of the dungeon. So like you're not getting 603s like you are at the end of that vault, you're getting 610s, which is substantially better because you're on the hero track. This is stuff that you're going to want to catalyze for sure if you're trying to get your tier set stuff going. You get more loot at the end of a Mythic Plus 7 than you do out of a Delve. Like I do feel like there is some balance that they're playing with there as far as the, the type of gear that you get and how much gear you get. Now you could get really lucky in Delves and get a bunch of maps. I, I had the fortunate thing this week where... I had Zekvir show up inside of a delve. I managed to kill Zekvir. He dropped his bone on the ground that I looted, got a map out of that, used the map immediately, went to the end of the delve, finished the delve, got the bonus chest, got another map, and then was able to do another delve and get another 610 out of the next one. And now that other 610 was useless, it was something I already had a, a 610 or so in and had really bad stats on it, so I'm not going to use it at all. But I mean, I think plus you can target gear a little bit easier because you at least do runs that have gear that you need out of them. But it, it was a nice thing that you can get. And I, I do understand that there's some people out there who are like, yeah, I get like four maps a week and that just gears up my character really fast. And that's really lucky of you. Congratulations. Wow. I have not seen that. Right. Like I, I, I think have... I got no maps this week and I did yeah. 20 tells. Right. Like it's, I got a, yeah. I got a couple of the previous week on on each character got a couple. But uh, nice. Wow. Yeah. I, I got I got no maps this past week out of those, which was a bummer because, uh, yeah, I mean, that was the main thing. I, I was thinking like, why, you know, I'll probably get like at least one a week. Right. And a 610 is for a character that's not rating, not yeah. doing keystones. A 610 end of run is an absurd upgrade. It's phenomenal so, upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. It's I've been, I've been having fun with it. You know, it's just I don't have unlimited time, you know, and I got sure. to pick my battles. And right now I want to be doing keys if I have people around. And I also have other stuff to do in life. So it's like if people aren't around and I could be doing delves, well, sure, I could. But there's other things that need my attention as well. So, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, overall, like. My 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 feelings about this this expansion. I mean, it's off to such a hot start. I I don't even know how to describe it. Yeah. Like a, a buddy of mine texted me last night. Uh, um, who uh, somebody I met through WoW, but who uh, you know I know in real life. He he's he is local to me. And we had been talking, you know, a couple months ago about, eh, yeah, maybe he should check the game out again or whatever. And he texted me last night just to check in and see how the expansion was going. And I'm like, dude, I don't even know how you can trust my opinion, you know, because I'm like kind of a lifer. It's not like I can. It's hard for me to be like, yeah, you should play WoW when I play it uh, every day anyway. But um, I told him, like, you know, the vibe I'm getting from everybody else is like the the strongest sentiment I've I've felt around a game in many years. Yeah. You know, it's not just the super bought in people it's the people who have been actively out for a long time who are coming back i mean the you know i, I think um a season of discovery was an inter interesting bridge to modern retail wow because i'm i'm noticing a lot of my classic buddies and stuff and uh you know just taking taking a look and going oh this is actually really cool oh wait i can do what oh this works like that oh that's really cool oh yeah maybe i'll play some retail you know and this is stuff that Ah, three, four years ago, maybe would have been kind of unthinkable, right? Yeah. Like the that divide was real. Um, the game just kind of didn't have that juice, and you know, laps players weren't interested in checking it out. There, there was the divide between classic and retail was was really um, significant, and I think you know they they've kind of they've kind of turned all that around with, with making a lot of good choices over the last three years or so, I would say, you know, second year of Shadowlands, as maligned as that expansion was, it's where they started to turn the ship around, and then we got a really great expansion, you know, following it, and, man, it's early, but it just feels like they took all that stuff that they built with Dragonflight and then just added onto it, you know, just learned a lot of good lessons from it, and lessons, yeah. yeah, and, like, took steps that weren't some drastic departure into something that they were hoping was going to pay off. It's just stuff that, you know, rewards players for engaging with the game and checking out the stuff that they built to do. So yeah, uh, it's, it's been really like a ridiculous first month of the expansion. When you think about it, you know, as we, as we stand, sit here on the, the 23rd, if you had early access, we've, we've been in for about a month now and it's just, it's been a real whirlwind. There's just been so much to do and, I think I think a lot of the stuff they did really paid off so far, you know. I mean, we'll see how we feel in, in two months from now, but uh, 
man, I just, I just can't wait to play more. I can't, I can't wait until all my responsibilities for the, for the day are done and I can sit down with my buds and get some keys or whatever going tonight. Yeah. I, I, I want to highlight two more things and then we're into what's going on this week. First and foremost, uh, I think everyone's trying to find their favorite Delve to run because running eight Delves in a week is a lot. I like Takrathon as a caster. For anyone who hasn't checked it out, it's in uh, it's sort of down by the city of Threads kind of area. It is an underwater Delve, which not everyone's a favorite of, but the last boss in that place is a basically a dude who puts mushrooms under your feet and you'd have to run around from and does a frontal and does a slam near him. And outside of that, he never melees you. So as a caster, you're like, great, all I have to do is move when there's mushrooms and not be in front of him. And I can just DPS him and he doesn't do anything to me. This is wonderful. So if you're someone who's like, hey, I want to do an eight and be sure I get a vault reward for the week because you can do non-bountiful eights and they still count as eights towards your vault, then I would say as a caster, check out Tacrathon because as much as you might stumble your way through, there's some difficult trash in there. Uh, that, that can be kind of a pain to sort of get through. But if you get through all that, the last boss is pretty much a freebie. So be sure that you, uh, you take advantage of that while you can. Uh, it, it is, it is a tricky place. Be sure you're doing small pulls, but, uh, and you know, and, and watching your breaths, so you don't drown, but the last boss is, is super simple. And I know that can be the big wall for a lot of people is especially with like the kobold ones where he's just running up and mailing you constantly and picking you up and shaking you like a rag doll and slamming you into the ground again. As a caster, that sucks. It does a ton of damage. You're kiting him all over the place. You're running from him. You're like, please, Bran, take aggro so I can actually do something. Like that's the, the whole time. So uh, I like Tacrathon for, for dealing with that. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention is while you're leveling, you actually are earning vault rewards. That was something else I noticed with my mage. I actually had a vault that I didn't know I had until I like hit max level That's cool. and yeah, started doing either. stuff. Uh, so nice. I had I had five, three 584 options waiting for me in my vault because I'd done some world quests and done some other things while I was leveling up because you do have to do a delve when you're leveling up. You have to do a dungeon when you're leveling up because they do the story mode stuff that you're able to get through as part of that. Those all count towards the vault, which means when you hit max level, you actually have a vault, which is kind of cool with 584s in it. Um, so you can check that out as well. All right, with that, let's hop into what's going on this week in World of Warcraft. All right, this week is the Battleground bonus event, meaning the signs of battle buff is up, honor gains from Battleground objectives and wins are increased by 50%, and there's a quest to win four random Battlegrounds for some Marks of Honor and Conquest. This is a great week for all those crafters out there who want to get the PVP recipes, this is your your chance to get that bonus, to get out, out there and get that bonus honor. I don't know if it stacks with the potions, but there are potions you can drink or files you can drink that give you bonus to your, uh, your honor gains that persist through death. If it does, then it might be worth picking up some of those off the auction house if you don't have the recipe yet, or if you're not an alchemist and getting in there and getting yourself a whole bunch of honor. You can buy up all those, you know, tailoring and jewel crafting and blacksmithing and whatnot recipes that you don't have yet it is also the pvp brawl temple for hot magoo uh, this is uh, temple of hot magoo with altered rules you're able to throw the orb from player to player and uh, they'll also gain the debuffs that you sort of pass when you pass the orbs around it is very silly very fast paced and uh, and a lot of good time they've also reduced the resurrection timer to five seconds so if you're like hey that's a battleground there's a Battleground bonus event happening. I could just do brawls for the whole week and get 50% bonus honor doing crazy PvP brawl temple for Hot Magoo. You're right. That is a great way to gain honor this week. So be sure you're taking advantage of, of those for the week. Uh, the quest There's a quest, obviously, like I said, to win four of those. There'll also be a quest to win the brawl. The quest to win the brawl also rewards you with some honor, conquest, and marks of honor. So it's a, a great way to sort of get a bunch of that done right away. Also, you'll get rep. I mean, there's also reputation att attached to these things too, so... Always worthwhile checking out. Okay. The other thing you're doing is you're picking up your Call of the World Soul quest. That's going to be happening near the inn. Just be sure you visit the inn area inside of Dornagal. They'll have quests for the dungeon for the week that you want to clear. Last week was Arakara. Uh, they'll have quests for the, the weekly task that you need to do. Um, it even has it for leveling characters. These things exist for leveling characters too. If you're leveling a character up, you can go and visit this area and they'll have something I, I had six world quests, so I just went out and did six world quests on my mage when my mage was leveling up and was able to get uh, one of those um, chests that I could actually get rewards from. The neat thing about those chests for rewards, even if you do like 
the spreading the light one where you're having to put three st stones into each of the, the lesser um, uh, braziers. You can actually still get a level 80 chest from that that you can't open till you're 80. But it means when you hit 80, you can then crack the chest open and get your first two items for the week right out of those chests the moment you hit 80. That's really nice. So if you're someone who's looking to get yourself some loot, that's another worthwhile thing to do is just bank those up on an alt while they're leveling up, which is a pretty nice thing to do. Uh, the world events, obviously, like we said, that you want to check out is at least do two of these, right? Uh, is the special assignments for world quests. The, uh, th those are the world quests that require you to do world quests in the zone to unlock. Uh, the theater troop, the awakening the machine, the spreading the light, the severed thread packs, or the world soul memories. Doing two of these things will guarantee you you get your actual piece of gear for the week, if that's a piece of gear you're still looking to get. Uh, and they also contribute towards your vault if you're someone who's trying to get world events done for your vault. It's another thing that you can have happen with that as well. Yeah, I just want to mention last week was the first time we we had the choose one call the world soul thing repeat. And so our expectation has been that this would sort of be your weekly cash uh, activity. And it just was it didn't happen more than once in a row. Right. Like we got it that one time and then we had other stuff. There was like the campaign questing. There was a thing about doing the Nerubian delves. Um I feel like that was probably to introduce these different systems or advance the story as we went through the first couple of weeks. So I'm thinking that you're going to get to choose one call the world soul thing on a relatively weekly basis at this point. But one thing that was different this time was like snuffling was out, but the severed threads pact was in, but the severed threads pact requires you to like complete five rumors and slay four rare creatures anywhere in Kazalgar zones. That seems like way worse than doing six world quests, which seems to be, on offer all the time so we'll see we'll, we'll, we'll keep a running log going of like what we've been offered for call of the world soul because yeah. so far we've seen five different things the dungeon rotates awakening the machine seems like it's it's been in there you know repeatedly world yeah. quests and then there's some other kind of outdoor activity that that i guess rotates along with the dungeon so we will keep an eye on it but um yeah you know just make sure that you are doing that if it's a character that you you care about you want to get your spark fragment and all that so Make sure that you you have that on your list, and I don't know. I I think, I mean, six six world quests. I think is pretty much the easiest buy in. If the weekly dungeon lines up, then that could be like a two for one. And if you're going to do awakening the machine anyway, it's two right for, for the it's, for the weekly, just, that's, that's also two for one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like a, a couple weeks ago, we had the world quest bonus event, which was is that like ten world quests or something? So yep. like that kind of yep. lines up too. You know what I mean? So sometimes you can kind of just get the double reward for basically the same time investment. So keep an eye on that. I, yeah, I, I, on and all, I logged in and I picked up the Severed Threads Pact quest and I was like, oh, this doesn't seem good, actually. Yeah. Like, it seems like too much time waiting for something to happen or like wandering around looking for something versus six well, world quests, you know? They do have the, you can buy them for Kedge, right? For like 25 Kedge or whatever, you can buy a rumor or buy a whatever, a map to a rumor, that kind of idea. So there is ways to sort of guarantee you find them as opposed to having to wander around. But yeah, Awakening the Machine to me is just the th my go-to. Like it just is. Like you, you get two for one. You get the Awakening the Machine rewards, which are those chests that you can open out front of the actual event. You get the world events uh, completion as well for doing the 20 waves. So that just, that to me is is like the go-to every time. Uh, okay, world bosses. This is Orda, the Broken Mountain, the the Deep Walker Giant in Ashkahet is what we are expecting is going to be up this week. This is the 603 eye level loot boss with your plate, legs, uh, and waist, your male chest and feet, your leather feet and legs, your cloth chest and waist. And it's a crit haste ring this week. The ring is the one thing that rotates. So be sure you're taking an, uh, advantage of, of killing that boss off. Also, remember you're going to get another catalyst charge this week. At least you should based off the two week rotation that we're all anticipating it is. And so that means that, uh, you know, you might be wanting to do this boss and maybe get something you're catalyzing. It's always tricky when you're like, hey, what should I do before I choose my vault loot? Well, depending on what your vault loot rewards, you might want to do the world boss first because you might go, hey, I got 603 plate legs and there's the tier legs in here and a weapon in here. What am I picking between? Do I want tier or do I want the weapon? Well, now I got the plate legs off of the world boss. Let's catalyze those and now I can pick the weapon like that. That is always one of those nice things to sort of fit in there, depending on where your item level's at and the content you're doing. We have Mythic Plus Affixes for the week. This past week was Ascendant. We don't know if this next week is going to be Voidbound. 
Oblivion or Devour. So Voidbound is any mob that gets buffed takes reduced damage. Killing the Void Emissary gives players a buff that gives them 20% cooldown reduction and 10% crit for 20 seconds. So this Void Emissary spawns while players are in combat and starts buffing enemies and these enemies take reduced damage. So you want to just kill the Emissary the moment it spawns and then you get yourself a bunch of buff uh, from that. So that that is a, a nice thing. That's reduced cooldown. That's sweet, sweet yeah. cooldown reduction. Exactly. Mm, that sounds like a good one. I mean, I guess it depends on how bad the Void Emissary is to kill and yeah. how, how buffed the mobs it's buffing uh, are, you know, end up. But yeah. um, I mean, we've seen we've seen ones kind of like this before, right? It, it was, But it would be in a static pack usually, or yeah. once you hit like a certain completion percentage of trash, then you would have like a similar mob like this spawn that you wanted to burn down for a big right. buff. So um, this one, I guess, is probably on a random interval, but it sounds like, because it says it spawns while in combat. Yeah. But yeah, if that's the one we get, switch to it, burn it down, and profit off of that big cooldown reduction and crit buff. Yeah. Next up would be Oblivion, is the other thing we have a chance of seeing. This is crystal spawn and move towards enemies while in combat. If the crystal reaches the enemy, the enemy gets 10% damage reduction. If the player absorbs the crystal, as in gets between the enemy and the crystal, or just runs over the crystal, they get a mastery and leech buff. This is like Boomkin's and, and Resto Druid's like favorite thing, is this mastery and leech buff. Uh, it's a huge damage increase, and so yes, I, I think this will be a very favorable one for players to grab. Last but not least, we have Devour, where players are periodically afflicted with a heal absorb while in combat. Healing or dispelling the absorb gives players a stacking 2% and 4% crit buff. Uh, falling, failing to dispel or um, heal, the absorb will heal enemies for 10% of their maximum health. So this one's a little bit stickier because this one, you could see people not really managing to get the dispel or the heal off in time because there's a lot of other damage going out and this is a healing absorb and it being one of those cases where you're like, ooh, you just watch that trash pack full heal because two people died or something like that. That would be really unfortunate. So I would say just be sure that we're, uh, we're you're, you're using your cooldowns and your personals and everything else. I love bringing healing pots into, into Mythic Plus right now. They're basically lay on hands because it's so much healing off of, you get like 3.5 or 4 million health back off of one healing potion. So it's a great way to be like, ooh, I'm low. Hey, the healing absorb just went out. Click, bam, healing absorb's gone. I get a nice buff, which is great. And I've saved the healer a bunch of work and I'm at full health again. So that's just a really nice way to sort of manage that. So yeah, Devour could be a tricky one this week. We'll see if we get that or not. So it's between Voidbound, Oblivion, Devour. That's going to be your affixes that kick in uh, right away. When you start doing level fours or above, we're assuming it's now going to rotate over to Fortified for the week since it was Tyrannical last week, which means non-boss enemies will have more health and deal increased damage. At level seven, you're going to be dealing with the death cost increase. That means every death inside a dungeon counts for 15 seconds as opposed to five. And then at tens, for those of you out there exploring it, you're going to be dealing with both Fortified and Tyrannical. And then if you push even higher to those twelves, it's going to be no Zalatath bargains at all. Just straight up, tyrannical, fortified, all enemies have a flat 20% increase to their damage and health. Crazy business that actually kicks in there. So just uh, <laughs> be aware when you're doing keystones this week that uh, once you hit fours, you're going to feel that bump on all that trash. But bosses should be falling over compared to last week. Any boss that you were like struggling with will have 30% less health on that keystone this week. And be doing 15% less damage if we're not dealing with the Tyrannical Week. So that is that is going to be a welcome relief for some of those bosses that uh, folks were, were trying to get through. So, yep. All right. Brewfest. It is live. We, we didn't mention it last week on the show, but it kicked off uh, right now and it's already going. It was kicked off two days ago, I think, and it runs until October 6th. So you got another two weeks until this goes away. It's going to be Sunday, October 6th. And yeah, it is uh, It is certainly worth checking out. There are some new things for this year. There's the Home Brewer's Sampling Mantle. It's a cosmetic back piece that you can wear for 200 prize tokens. Uh, obviously, in Dragonflight, they also added in those uh, bar tab barrels, as well as some daily quests for the barreling down and the bubbling brews. Uh, and so be sure you're heading back to Valdraken to do those quests, if that's something you're wanting to do. And then, of course, you can always do the Ogrimmar and Ironforge Chowdown Challenge, as well as the timed events they have there to get even more tokens. These tokens are not a currency that goes inside your currency tab. They're not transferable between your characters, but you can 
purchase different rewards on different characters and obviously those toys and whatnot and and transmogs are account wide so that is a way to to manage it i was doing it on three characters this week on the downtime that i could find to do it which was tricky because it's like hey want to go do mythic plus absolutely let me just finish riding this ram really quick so that yeah. i can get some tokens i'm I not gonna get over to the mystic else. ward and yeah. then i'll be ready to go do the keystone yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah so there were some rewards you want to get you do need to do a couple of the dailies you'll need um the goggles that cost 200 uh, of those tokens and so if you can actually get those goggles that cost 200 of those tokens you can then unlock a couple more dailies for that character and that uh that will help you out a lot with finishing stuff off too okay that's yeah, there great. is the there's the intro quest too. I think it's the one for the Wolpertingers where they'll give you the uh, synth brew goggles, and uh, when you turn it in, like you don't give them back, so you can hang on to those if you do that quest. Um, right. I was all caught up uh, from last year. I had I I actually I got the uh, mount armor even, and I got the new stuff that they added to the vendor. I think it was was it the shield last year. Mm. So this year, the new thing is a back cosmetic that looks similar to the shield from yep. last year, I think. I think they they, yep. re, they did like a different color scheme on it, but it's a similar design. I So this was the only thing I, I don't I didn't have from the vendor. I logged in and I did all of the like the one time quests around the event. You know, I, I did the the timed like the assault. I, I got I got that done and I did the, you know, all the quests around the different events, the ram riding and the the. Uh, the sausage eating um, uh, thing. There's yep. a one-time quest for that. I did the Wolpertingers. I went around and did the pink elephants and in, in the other cities and all that. Um, went to Valdraken and did the um, the two dailies the ride there. The barrel. Yeah. Yeah, and I ended up with like you know I did core and dire brew all that. I ha ended up with like 208 tokens or something just in about an hour of yep. doing a whole lap of the thing. And then, so I'm done with Brewfest, I guess. It's kind of a bummer because it is like one of the one of the better in-game in holidays. I do really like it, and um, I think the stuff they added in in Valdraken is cool too. But I don't really have any reason to do them. You can also get like the heirloom tokens and stuff with the to with yep. the Brewfest tokens, but they're yep. not scaled up, right? Like we don't have a new tier of like level eighty heirlooms, I, so that's like probably not a good use of them. So it's like there's really no. I have no motivation to do any more of this because I have I have both of the mounts from Core and Dire Brew for many years and like yeah Core and drops gear but it's like a heroic dungeon equivalent item level it is upgradable um, so you know it could be an option uh, especially for trinkets or something if you're just looking to fill in slots with item level on somebody but I mean there's so much stuff to buy I just happen to be super caught up from you know paying attention to it over the years and going okay I need I I gotta check these off I'm gonna get this many tunes going I'm gonna budget out how many tokens i'm gonna get every day you know what i mean yeah i did that i think a couple years ago so now it's just like okay let me buy whatever the new thing is but yeah you can get 200 tokens on a tune like that for just from one day of doing like the intro quests and a full loop of the dailies and you can also get what uh, if you do the the bar tab barrels that they yeah, added the in, in dragonflight they added new ones too yep, like in the castle guard the zones they're there yep. So, I mean, that, I think they give 10 tokens each. So that's like 100 just from doing the Kazogar uh, bar tabs. And then I think there's 12 in in uh, Dragon Isle. So, that, I mean, that's 220 right there just from flying around and, yep, and it's paying some gold. Yeah, there's an achievement for, for the ones in Dragon Isles. Um, I don't think they added a new achievement this year, which is a little weird, but so be it. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of people probably miss that if you kind of checked out on the – you know, latter stages of uh, Dragonflight, second year of Dragonflight or whatever, if you didn't really play it, um, then all this stuff is new to you. So don't forget it's there if you want to do Brewfest stuff because that's an extra 220 tokens in your pocket just from doing the bar tabs in those two continents. And then it's like 20 tokens a day from those two pretty quick daily quests in Valdraken on top of everything else. Uh, you could definitely check some stuff off your list if you uh, take advantage of all that. Yep, and for those who are curious, Corn Dire Brew is dropping item level 571. So feels a little low. Could be 583, I think, for Corn Dire Brew stuff, but still nice to uh, nice to get some loot in there if that's something you're looking for. Item level wise, that is on par with the max rewards for some of the world quests that are out there. And of course, at 6:15 a.m. and p.m., there's a the two-hour enthusiast buff you can pick up for 10% more experience. If that's something you're hoping to hop in and get, that is the opening and closing of the times for the event that they supposedly have little ceremonies for opening and closing for. Okay, hot fixes for the week. 
We did see some balance passing and bug fixing taking place for some classes, so be sure that you have a peek to see if you were affected by that. I'm sure you've probably already felt it by now, uh, but some of these changes are coming in in the upcoming week. We'll talk about the, that, those class tuning things a little bit later on, so be sure you're checking that out. Dell's got another pass where they've been closely monitoring progress in Dell's, and we've seen that the median time to complete a delve at higher tiers has been longer than we'd like for the majority of classes. And they're gonna to continue to evaluate what might be needed to maintain the difficulty across tiers while also shaping the overall time that a delve takes to complete, uh, which I like actually seeing that they're sort of going, okay, what's the median for what, what's being completed by different players on different specs and different you know roles and trying to actually find a way to balance that out so that it's not too much of a disparity and is closer in line with the speed at which they're hoping people to complete them, which is kind yeah, of an interesting think, thing. Think, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. It's kind of an interesting thing for a, a task that does not have a time limit on it, because you can absolutely, if you wanted to, halfway through a delve, just get up, go make yourself a sandwich, eat your sandwich, and then come back to your delve. <laughs> like you could totally do that. I, I have then, not done that exact thing, but I've done many similar things right. inside of it. Like, okay, I'm just going to leave this here for a few minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. Yep. And, and that could really skew that median. So I do wonder if they're using tools to filter out AFK time where someone has not interacted with anything or moved in a certain period of time and go and filter all those out of the actual chart that we're looking at for putting together these medians so that we're not not getting confused by like, you know what? People who play hunters just like to AFK a lot. I'm just going to say it. They do. That's just a thing. So, you know, maybe they're watching a movie. Maybe they go to the bathroom. Maybe they're making a sandwich. Maybe their mom wanted them to do the dishes, whatever it was, you know, that, that just out created an outlier for that class. That's entirely a possibility. So I'm sure they're looking at ways to sort of filter that down. But we did see reduces in boss health, lieutenants, rares, all that health got reduced, and uh, as well as the unique objective creatures. But Jason, you wanted to hop in there for a second. Well, yeah, I, I feel like the the fixes that they made to this end were really noticeable. You know, the health reduction on the bosses and, and rares and stuff. I, I felt that pretty significantly, especially at... The item level that my my monk and druid are sitting at, right? Which is, I mean, a druid's like like well sub six hundred. So, you know, the 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 combat times for soloing and guardian spec they're they're really long. Uh, they're still pretty long, but uh, I definitely felt these changes significantly, like right away. You know, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. Sounds like good changes. Let me check it out. I went, yeah, this actually, like, you know, it's. I think there's a point where a mob can be dangerous, but you don't have to be in combat with it for like four minutes to for that to, to be the case, right? <laughs> yes, like agree. Okay, I've like I've done the dance for yeah. for two and a half minutes and I've survived and I I have mastered the three abilities that they're throwing at me. And now I'm just waiting, right? And, yeah. I, and now, granted, like, again, th there there is item level. There's a lot of character power out there still to get for mm, all of us. Like, and, you know, I mean, nobody's yep. like 640 item level or whatever the ceiling is. There's a lot of levels for Bran to get. And I noticed Bran really powering up, like, as you continue to level him through the 40s. Like, his contribution starts to feel really significant. So, you know, this is stuff that's going to smooth out kind of naturally over time to some degree. But also, like... Uh, do you want to antagonize people with this mob that just never dies? Uh, that, like, I, I think it's, yeah. Like, I definitely, I, I do think it's, like, median time seems like a good metric until you have yeah. the cases like you mentioned. But maybe they, maybe they have some way to, like, account for inactivity or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like, they know mm -hmm. when you're sending input to the game. So maybe they can kind of, you know, filter that out or whatever. But, um, yeah, I think... Um, you know the, the tuning changes around that stuff, and the and the time to kill on the on the higher health mobs. I I think that felt really good. Yeah, overall delves have gotten a, a lot better this week, and I think they'll continue to get better next week. We also saw increases to brands damage by 125 percent across all damage and healing tiers. We saw increased damage to the uh, damage reduction brand takes by 80 percent, so he's less likely to die, even though he's standing in webs, which he tells us not to stand in webs and do. Uh, all those sorts of things are are things that they sort of went into and checked, and then they also went in and did bug fixes and and some some tuning passes to uh, to not only Zekfir's influence, um, the the tier nine uh, creatures that are in there, uh, and the lieutenants and whatnot for tier nine dells for folks who are experimenting into that, but also just actual reductions in like pack sizes and things like that inside delves. So overall, they're in a better place than they were last week. Okay, normal and heroic. Difficulties and uh, dungeon bosses, other than the final boss, no longer drop Valor Stones. 
So if you're inside normal dungeons or uh, you're inside dungeons and raids and doing normal and heroic bosses, they don't drop Valor Stones anymore. So no longer will you be like, I'm capped on Valor Stones. I'm mid-raid. I better go spend some because I'm going to earn some off killing this boss. You're now in a situation where uh, the the, uh, the the bosses aren't doing that anymore. Okay. We all, also, it, it, you know, this should cut down on, I mean, listen, I... I can't imagine that people would be griefing in this way because it's so ridiculous, but people will do anything that is considered to be time efficient in, in this video game yep. specifically. Yep. So this should cut down on like, oh, I need a very small amount of Valor Stones. Let me queue up for a dungeon and kill one boss and then drop group, right? And then yeah, you know, now yeah. you're stranding people in queue and you all know, that. Like, If only you could it, farm wax puddles for Valor I mean, it just seems like that yeah. might have solved that problem for you, Jason, right there. But I mean, I, 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 feel, I feel like, you know, Valor Stones should be a reward for various <laughs> things. Things, right but like you want to put them in this kind of group content typically right mm -hmm. and like I, I think considering sort of the the behavior that we've seen at the outset of the expansion around dungeon queues and stuff like de-incentivizing people from dropping after you know mid mid dungeon bosses is it probably makes sense you want to you know like obviously things happen right but when you match make a group together, the expectation should be that that group is going to complete the dungeon. That's that's the way I feel about it as a player. Like, I understand that there are extenuating circumstances. There's tech issues. Um, there's real life that occurs outside of the game. But when I click that button and we all load into the thing, I assume that everybody is in there to complete the dungeon together, not that somebody is in there to kill one boss and get out as fast as they possibly can because they have to get on to the next thing yeah a lot of the time that was that was in happening in normals and heroics to bosses but yes it'd be weird if it was happening uh for valor stones i certainly agree that i'm glad that's not the case when this is happening um they fixed some more bug fixes in the raid as well and did some minor tuning on ulgrax something to consider uh just basically saying hey hungry bellows is an ability that's supposed to ignore f physical resistance so we've buffed the dam we they've reduced the damage on hungry bellows but they've now fixed it so it actually does so just keep that in mind uh as far as <laughs> the uh the dungeons go we did see some tuning passes none of them changed the like percentage of trash needed i think they probably want some more iterations of people running the dungeon before they start making changes that way but we saw some damage reductions inside uh, Arakara, uh, so the, the, the last boss in there got some damage reductions, which was nice for folks to sort of feel. Uh, we also had um, Grim Batol fix an issue where Forge Master Throngus's pool uh, visual could fail to appear when it was on stairs, which was really unfortunate if you walk over stairs and just die instantly because you stepped inside something you shouldn't have. Um, so that was a nice thing to get fixed. Um, you definitely don't want to step in that. And yep. you fight him like on a path that contains stairs. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that got fixed. Yep. I didn't run into this, but um, yeah, that would, that'd be bad. You're like, I'm safe from Throngus's molten pool of death. Nope. Oh wait, I'm dead, but there's no molten pool there. What happened? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was that. So yep. yeah. Nice to see. Similarly, Miss Caller had a fix where dodgeball was dealing damage to unintended targets. Um, so yeah, this, anything that's not intended should get fixed. That was sort of like Throngus's thing. So keep that in mind as well. And then Siege of got a whole bunch of, uh, of little tweaks done to it, including Jaina Proudburn now teleports players to the correct exit location based on their faction. So Horde players are not dumping into Baralis and getting killed by guards. You know, that's just one of those things. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably. They they made a change to Siege of Baralis that I'm still dealing with emotionally oh, yeah. because throughout BFA, right, and we had it like every season in BFA, you would come in, start the dungeon, jump uh, as Alliance, jump down yep. to the left to the lower docks. You can't do that anymore. It just teleports you well, outside the instance. You can with um, an ability. Heroic Leap will do it, and Wild Charge will do it. You can get over top of the teleport. But there is a teleport there. <laughs> yeah, but the rest of your party has to come with you. That's exactly so the all problem. They need parted, all druids and warriors. Out of the, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're all... Yeah. Um, man, you know, I, I I also have been running with, like, mostly resto druids. And, yeah, yeah um, 
the 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 buffs would be appreciated as soon as we can yes, get those things. Agreed. Um, uh, but but yeah, like you can't like the, that route is just not going to work. Yeah. Um, at this point, so just having to kind of relearn the beginning of it is a little weird. Um, Pull trash we've never pulled before in our lives. Yeah, yep. like literally, maybe like one time ever back in 2018. Um, overall, like I think I was not. I mean, I don't love Siege of Paralysis, and I don't love having it back, but I was afraid it was going to be worse so far. Like, it feels okay. I do. I love the new visuals on on Chopper Red Hook. It really helps understand where is safe to stand and where not to stand. So thank you for those. Um, like the big frontal on the, on the melee ads, for example. Yeah. And, you know, I think some of the, the bosses, they got like minor tweaks that just make them feel a bit more modern and a bit better to play. Last boss is so much better than it used to be where you were kind of on this timer of like how fast can i kill these tentacles before another one spawns you know you don't have to worry about that anymore so boss execution is super important especially early season and and with tyrannical and everything but i yeah. i it just feels more fair i think in in a lot of ways than the bfa version did yeah the two things i have about siege of browse right now one is the uh, the boss before the last boss the double waves really took took threw me back the first time i experienced it I was not expecting double waves, and so that uh, that felt very tight and like crazy to sort of deal with, but I like it overall. I think it's a good change. And the other one was there's one trash mob, one dock hand or whatever, right before Chopper Red Hook, who just stands close enough to Red Hook that you always pull the boss when you try and pull that mob. And it it's irritating, and I wish they would just remove or move that one trash mob so that you aren't going, well, I either pull the boss with an additional trash mob when I do this, or you move that ad somewhere else and you pull the boss, you essentially just reset the boss, which is what we have been doing is we do the big pull, we get that ad in it, the boss comes running with it and you just back out of the whole docks area and the boss resets and you're like, okay, it'd be perfectly yeah. fine if they just didn't have that ad where it was, but there's impossible to do that pull properly with that ad so close to the boss. So uh, that was, that's one of the little tweaks I would do with, with, with Siege of Browse. Okay. They also resolved an issue where the map tooltip for theater event was displaying incorrect information about the current play. So for someone who was trying to complete all of the plays, may have been doing the wrong ones or showing up and seeing it was the wrong performance, that is unacceptable. It must be, the show must go on and the show must be the correct show that's supposed to happen. So that is fixed. Uh, and then I guess we talk about a little bit Mythic Plus tuning that's now live. We did see uh, the, the 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 one fix that came in for Necrotic Wake where, hey, they noticed that, you know, those orbs were spawning and they were hitting the wrong thing. So that... That actually got fixed, so you're not hooking an orb as opposed to hooking the boss on that third boss. Uh, Zoramus Gatekeeper's Wrath of Zoramus damage was also reduced by 25%, as well as the Gatekeeper's enemy forces contribution was increased, which does help a little bit. You're still clearing a lot of trash. Uh, I still think you have to be 73 or 78% or something before you go up to the third boss if you want to actually complete that place, which is, seems like a lot of trash downstairs. Uh, the... Surgeon Stitch Flesh's uh, Creations Festering Rot periodic damage was also reduced by 20%. And in City of Threads, we saw Izo the Grand Sli Splicer. Uh, the duration of Splice reduced to six seconds from nine. It's a nice big damage reduction there as well. So that was- Yeah, good, I mean, that's, a, that's a huge nerf to that. Yeah. And that dot hurts. Um, just a couple of things yeah. on the dungeon tuning changes. Sure. Like um, the Zoramus Gatekeeper is like killable. I think I feel like with these um, with these changes it's because the, the risk. Re it, but. Yeah, but it was you would you would pretty much like usually go out of your way to avoid it and then make it mm. up with some of the other stuff. I think like with the damage reduction and increasing its count, uh, like I went in there uh, yesterday. We we killed it as we were working our way around up to first boss trash yeah. and it worked out pretty well. So, you know, maybe something to consider there. One thing about Splice for my warrior friends, it is spell reflectable. Yes, it is. And I believe that it's on a timer that's long enough that you can pretty much spell reflect every one. And like, it's not a thing where, oh, well, you take like, you, you have reflect up because it's some kind of magic dot or something. Like, no, you put the dot on the boss with spell reflect and yeah. not on you. So um, keep that in mind, have that handy when Splice goes out because... 
your healer might be crying on on this boss in general. You got to move around a lot, <laughs> and there's a lot of like, there's that there's the Crypt Lord slam that like does raid wide or party wide damage even if you're not in the circle, and then yep. the dots on everybody, and then you got to run around because the orbs are flying around. So, yeah, spell reflect is really good, and I, I maybe just diffuse magic, like kick it off of you and put it on on the boss. But I don't know, it's, I don't know if it's magic, but yeah. So you know, just stuff like that. These these are these little things that were sort of experimenting with early days of the season right and like oh how can i what can i do about this or what's the counterplay to that and yeah reflecting splice feels really good yeah yeah i had a city of thread story from this week where we were in there with it was four guildies and one pug and the pug was the healer uh holy paladin we got to the last boss and the timer ran out as we got to the last boss and the pug just went well thanks and left <laughs> i was like okay Why? I will zone oh, out no. and change to Resto Druid. We're going to four-man this boss, which is what we did. It took us three pulls, but we got it. And so <laughs> it's one of those cases where you're like, I don't, I don't get it, but that's what some people are doing, like, like already. Get, yeah, like it, it stinks to miss a timer, but like if you miss a timer by like a little bit and it's week one of I know. Keystone season, like it's still pretty good to finish the dungeon. Good ratings. Get some, get some end of run loot. Yeah, you'll probably still get some rating. You'll definitely yeah. get some progress for your vault. Uh, yeah, that yeah. seems like not the correct choice. But, you know, yeah. hey, maybe they maybe they had to, to go do their chores or something. I don't know. It was, a, it was a very strange thing to experience during the whole run, run of the dungeon up to that point and being like, oh, well, timer's out. I'm out. See ya. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, I guess we'll just... Do this as four of us. That's just the way it is. Okay, class tuning adjustments. Now, this is something I'm going to ask players to go and look at for themselves. So basically, we got Death Knight, Druids, Hunters, Mages, Priests all got touched for PvE. And PvP had even more changes for folks that are actually curious about PvP stuff. So be sure you go and check the show notes for the incoming hotfixes that are going to go live tomorrow. As far as Druids go, that 4% increased healing is coming, which is not going to be stupendous like I, I really think that needs to be like 12 percent increased healing to be honest it's a very weird gap that's been created i was finding myself pretty consistently behind by at least five or six percent if not more other healers and that's you know not not looking at the overhealing numbers necessarily but there certainly was a lot of overhealing taking place there with some of the healers going on but i, I do feel like that needs to be a higher number they'll look at this week and and decide what needs to happen we did see Beast Mastery Hunters get Beast Cleave and Kill Cleave damage increased by uh, 90% as opposed to 80%. So we got bumped up another 10% for you all. And they're struggling to make Fire Mages relevant. So that's a thing. Uh, we do know that they're also trying to make Frost Mages have a little bit more variety in their kit by boosting the damage on Glacial Spike as well as Ray of Frost. Ray of Frost being an ability that's not being used very much. So good to see that that's getting some attention. And Shadow Priest just getting a static 4% damage increase. So good on you, Shadow Priest. Check you out. Okay, that's, uh, that's the class stuff. I'll, I'll, you know, again, throw a link in the show notes. So be sure you're checking that out and grabbing that. So you can have all of the latest updates that you need for your class. Yeah, and all that stuff is out with uh, regional maintenance this week. Yeah, this is yeah, it's, it's Tuesday in NA and and Wednesday, Wednesday in EU and yep. wherever else your maintenance may be. It's not live at the moment. So if you're going, hey, wait a minute, all my numbers are the same. Well, yeah, they will be until after maintenance. So, yep. but yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to see tweaks like this every week for quite some time. I feel like. Um, you know, it's just what we saw throughout Dragonfly, you know, um, the first like entire half of every season, I feel like they were doing tuning tweaks, you know, every week or every other week, at, uh, something like that. Um, they're in kind of, they are, we were kind of talking about this before we started recording the show, but they are in kind of a weird spot with some of the tuning because of their unofficial slash official support of the race. And it's like, well... If there are outliers or there are problems, like, do we fix them or not until the race is done? Because a fix could really skew the race. Um, so I think there's like there's probably some tuning that needs to happen that maybe it's just not it's not going to happen until maybe next week or something. So, you know, we'll see. There's going to be a lot more to come, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, the next post we want to talk about here is about missing items from guild banks. Basically, when a, a, a patch came in for 11.0.2, the something happened with the patch that made particularly uh, crafting reagents, profession rate materials from old expansions vanish from guild banks in some ways. So that apparently happened as well as in some rare cases, other items went missing from guild banks. 
And so they've spent the past couple of weeks kind of ripping that apart, seeing what was lost and doing their best to put together those packages of things that have gone missing and mail them to guild leaders. So that should be coming out soon. Your guild leader should be getting one of these, these emails or not meals, in-game mails from, uh, from a dev saying, Hey, here's all your stuff, but they weren't able to necessarily get everything. So they're also apologizing for the long wait and also, you know, appreciate the problems that have there. I'm sure if you get the care package and you were like, I have a screenshot of what was in my bank. I know I had this thing. I'm still missing this thing. You can submit a ticket and see if you can get that resolved for yourself. But yeah, it's uh, it's something that they need to tear apart and put back together again. And they're not really 100% sure as to why it happened. So they just basically said they found the culprit. It was a technical update made to support cross realm guilds. That something in doing that was the cause of this. So that's all all we know. I assume they know a lot more than we do, but that's all that all they're giving us when it comes to this sort of thing. So I appreciate the update. Yeah. It's not really surprised that like this process broke stuff, right? Yeah. It's not great. It sucks that this happened. I hope that like I, I, I don't know. I I don't I don't love the uh we've reached a point where the result will be an incomplete restoration for some guilds. Like yeah. How do you not have a way to restore the m remaining missing items? That part to me doesn't make sense. You can uh, presumably like just spin up the items and mail them to the GM or something, right? Like I, 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 I I'm mean, assuming they whatever. don't I, know what they were. I'm assuming that's what they're yeah, saying. I, like guess. I, like yeah. I assume that's a caveat they're throwing in because they're like, look, we don't know what you lost. We've recovered what we can recover from our stuff, but there's going to be people yeah. out there who go, I had... 18 of these and they're not inside this care package and then basically this is their caveat of being like look we got what we could get yeah right? yeah i mean it's it's bad it's not it's yeah. not great it, like i the the silver lining would be that hopefully most of the stuff does not have any kind of real impact on people's day-to-day -day gameplay i mean they say many of these items were related to professions materials from prior expansions yeah like it's cool and fun to hang on to stuff, you know, just in case or something. I don't know. Like, I do it. I hoard stuff in WoW all the time. But do I ever use any of it? No. So, like, hopefully it doesn't have any massive impact on the way yeah. people play the game. But, like, you, uh, I mean, you would think, like, Blizzard should have known that stuff was going to break and have had some kind of disaster recovery plan that w didn't result in reaching a point where the result will be an incomplete restoration for some guilds, right? Like that's not, that's not where they should have ended up. There, there yeah. should have been a better way to back up this data and go, okay, we're going to put it all back the way that we found it. Or, or like, I don't know. I mean, like a heads up, like, Hey, uh, you might want to uh, move stuff out of your, move older stuff out of your guild bank or something until the, like so, something instead of just going, Oh, yeah, sorry, your stuff got lost. Oh, we don't know what it was and we can't put it back. I mean, it's just, it's not great service, but like the mitigating factor should be that hopefully most of the stuff doesn't matter in the War Within, which is the, to me, is the important part, right? Like you're not, you're not, you didn't lose stuff that you actually need to use on Tuesday, hopefully. Yeah, I, I, I still feel like this is just a, a, a caveat rider baked in basically saying, hey, we're not going to be spending a lot of attention to tickets and CS around this issue necessarily. Or we've told our CS team, if you see tickets and stuff around this, it's best efforts. And, you know, we're not expecting to make sure everything gets recovered if someone's claiming they had, you know, 10,000 iron ore that was sitting inside of their bank. And now they don't have that 10,000 iron ore based off the restoration that they got. Like, I, I feel like that might be what this is more than saying, hey, we know that we can't give everything back. Then we, we you know, are sorry for that. I think really it, it, it feels it feels to me. I hope what it is, is, hey, we know that some people are going to claim that there was stuff inside their banks that and we have no way of proving there was or wasn't. So we're just saying, you know, best efforts. But anyways, uh, that's a that's something that happened. It's a shitty thing that happened. And hopefully that uh, that builds new systems and processes in for the next time. They run into something like this as far as mergers go. Okay, PvP Weapons of Conquest update. So this is from Kaivax. He says, we've closely followed the discussion about the Weapons of Conquest quest for the free Gladiator weapon, and we've decided to update it. Due to concerns regarding the current implementation of the quest, we took the opportunity to reevaluate how we could approach the situation. We'd like to try putting weapon choice back in the hands of players while smoothing out some of the rough edges that sparked your feedback. 
With hotfixes, we will make the following changes. The quest uh, weapons of conquest will depreciate and be removed from all pl quest players' quest logs. A new achievement called Forged Weapons of Conquest will be added to the Feet of Strength PvP category with the criteria of earning 2,500 Conquest during War Within Season 1 on that character. Progress towards this achievement is retroactive, and you can review your progress uh, towards it by checking your season earned amount on your Conquest currency. Upon completion of this achievement, you will be awarded two Forged Gladiators weapon tokens via mail, Similar to the mark of the Spelunker Supreme from the Seasonal Milestone Achievement is what how that's going to work. So basically you get this token, you go to a vendor, you trade the token in for the thing that you want. Uh, the mark of the Supreme of the Spelunker Supreme was what I got for doing my 2,000 above rating inside Mythic Plus. That's how I got my tier piece. While in possession of these tokens, Lalandi in Dornigal will offer weapons from her entire selection, allowing you to choose your preferred weapon, all two-handed weapons will cost two tokens. All one-handed and off-hand pieces will cost one token. Warriors are an exception to equitability, accommodate, to equitably accommodate fury, and will find that their two-handed weapon options only cost one token. Once you have spent both tokens, Lalandi will offer her weapons for conquest once more. As before, you cannot purchase weapons with conquest until after earning the forged weapons of conquest achievement on that character. That's character specific, not warband specific. Keep that in mind. These updates are planned for the next weekly maintenance, which is tomorrow. At that time, the seasonal conquest cap will be increased beyond the threshold needed to earn this achievement. As always, we would like to thank everyone for sharing their thoughts over the past couple weeks. Good luck on the fields of battle. Thank you so much, Kyvax, for putting that down so clearly and so cleanly illustrated so that folks can really understand it. This is the, the big thing for me is it's pretty obvious what's going on and that folks can uh, can really take advantage of this once it goes live tomorrow. Yeah, I think the problem with the Weapons of Conquest uh, quest, from what I gather, was that, you know, it would offer you a reward, not like let you buy stuff from the vendor. It would you complete the quest and then you would get your quest reward weapon. Yeah. Except it seemed like the quest wasn't real smart about like what it was offering you maybe it was bugged or something i saw i saw some reports of people saying that the w weapons offered for the quest reward like didn't match the spec they were playing so that's you know obviously not great you don't want a weapon that isn't for your spec right like but you know uh, apparently it just wasn't the the rewards weren't what you wanted and it wasn't like you could buy what you wanted from the vendor right with the with what you had earned also, the quest required you, I believe, to earn that conquest in rated BGs and epic BGs, if I'm not mistaken. Whereas with this achievement, it's just, you know, 2,500 conquests earned during the season. So yeah. that gives people more flexibility for how they want to approach it. And then it should really streamline the weapon acquisition because you should be able to just get whatever you want off the vendor. So uh, I don't I, I can't, you know fathom a guess as to like how the quest ended up being busted and apparently the way it was but uh, this seems like better behavior anyway right like you're, you're not making people do specific content to earn the conquest and then they can just choose whatever they want off of the vendor just like as they'll be able to do for offset or off spec weapons and everything going forward after this 2500 conquest threshold is reached so Seems like a good change, although it must have been pretty frustrating. Like, I've again, I'm not a pvp -er, I haven't done PvP in a while. And it must have been pretty frustrating. You know, like, okay, I got to the end of this quest. I did what I was asked to do, and now I can't get what I bargained for out of it. So, you know, that, that does stink. And hopefully this is, um, you know, this, is, this seems like it should work much better. Right? Yeah. Unless the, unless the vendor's bugged, I guess. But as long as you can get what you want of the vendor, then it's a big win. Yeah, I, I'm overall happy with the changes. I think it's a smart way to do it. Okay, so 20th anniversary event is coming up. They've been doing PTR updates for this thing, and one of the PTR updates that's gone in recently was that you can now do the time-walking versions of Deadmind, Zulfarak, Dire Maul, East and West Wings, and Stratholme, uh, the Living and Undead Dungeon. That you can actually get in there and check it out, and you can group finder uh, with players level 10 and above to explore these. An interesting twist on how all of this is going to work is that time walking dungeons are now going to scale enemies to your current level 
as opposed to scaling you to the level of the dungeon. And basically what they go in here dev-wise saying is time walking now uses the same scaling system as Chromie time, allowing us to better maintain time walking dungeons and control their intended tuning, which I find really interesting because when I see a change like this, I'm like, whoa, are they going to completely break time walking the next time it rolls around live because stuff's going to be so out of whack as to how it scales. But at the same time, I'm like, but this is a much cleaner way to do it. I've never liked scaling my character down to like level 38 or something when I went into a dungeon to do it. That always felt really weird. And then your numbers are all over the place. You're hitting stuff for very high or very low numbers, depending on what expansion it was and where damage was at that time. And it just, it was awkward and, and weird. Whereas I, I like this a lot more where it's scaling the dungeon up to meet our level and the gameplay will basically be, hey, your character as it currently is, is stepping through a portal into this equal level challenge to what would be like running a dungeon in the current expansion that you're in, which I think is great. So I, I like this change. I'm a little nervous about this change, but that's why it's on PTR. So if you want to hop in and try out some of these yeah. time walking dungeons, please do and leave feedback for the devs in case something's really broken. I have a feeling that this is, is going to mean that time walking gets a lot harder than what we've been used to um, of late. Yeah, but right. yeah, I mean, this may mean no more 40 minute black temples, but I guess I guess we'll see. Um, well, it just says dungeons. So maybe it's not. Maybe raids do something different. Um, I don't know. I, I like when time walking dungeons are, you know, difficult on the spectrum of time walking difficulty. They feel really bad in my experience uh, now maybe that's because of like the templating and stuff they, they I mean they used to like template your character i don't know if they still do this but it'd be like okay you're this level and you're this class and spec all right your stats are this and time walking and um you know they would it would really drastically alter the way like my tune would play because it'd have so much less haste than i was accustomed to and that right. makes the whole game feel different to play yeah and so you know i guess we'll see how how it ends up feeling but like part of the problem is the time walking dungeons aren't designed to be like modern and current content, right? They're, they're very old content in some cases, and we're getting a lot of old content with this event too. And, you know, they're not something that players are engaging with on a daily basis. They're around for like one or two weeks a season. And so people don't know how they work. And if there's like a particularly yeah. complicated mechanic in a time walking dungeon, then you can guarantee that most of the group is not going to know what to do with it. Yep. So, I mean, that could lead to just some really bad feelings around a mode that's supposed to be kind of just fun, you know? So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what it ends up feeling like. Hopefully what it results in, I, I guess my hope would be that the, the difficulty doesn't really substantially change but your character feels like your character regardless of if you're in a heroic dungeon or a time walking dungeon that would be nice and maybe using the different scaling tech will allow them to to kind of dial that in a bit better I, I i don't know but if it if it spikes the difficulty for time walking then i don't think anybody's going to be having fun with that yeah other changes coming up that i'm super excited about uh, the first of which is is a decent change, which is new characters that are created are now placed into the campfire scene if there's room or directly under it for your warband when you're first logging in. Just keep that in mind so it's easier to find that new character you just made. But my favorite change coming up is that reagents stored in the warband, warband bank can now be used to fill all types of crafting orders. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I realized this too late uh, that this was not actually live and, and in the game. And about a week ago, I moved all of my crafting materials into Warbank tabs because I was like, great, I can just use them across all my characters whenever I want to use them, and I can to craft whatever it is I want to craft. However, <laughs> I can't use it for crafting orders, which means whenever I want to do a crafting order, I have to go back to my bank, take out the stuff that I need for the crafting order, go back over to the crafting person, and then use it all, which is really unfortunate. The other thing I've noticed that happens if I'm trying to craft a series of things, and this is something that isn't being fixed yet, but I'm hoping that me talking about it might help. Uh, if I'm trying to craft like 10 potions, I'm trying to craft them from stuff that's in my war bank. I can craft one at a time. It will not let me craft 10 in sequence of just clicking create all or creating create 10. It'll craft one and then go, can't find the materials. And you craft one and go, can't find the materials for the next one. It always does that. So that's really unfortunate. So hopefully they can, they can get that resolved as well because that would be really nice. Um, we also saw that accounts that fall under the age appropriate design code, the AADC, will now have the blocked guild invite setting turned on by default 
which is great for those youngins getting in to actually jump in and try the game and play it. So they're not dealing with spams of guild invites and that sort of thing. And when logged into a character, the add-on list dropdown will now default to that character rather than all, which is also really nice. It only took 20 years, but yep. <laughs> we got there. Yep. Like, I don't know about you, but I usually, well, if I go into the add-on menu, I want to adjust the add-ons for the character that I'm playing primarily. So, yeah, all, yeah. like the smallest tweak imaginable, but uh, man, what it, the amount of clicks it's going to save me, uh, you know, for going forward from having to switch that add-on tab. It's, yeah. it's immense. Now we just need them to, to switch around the macro tabs. So the macros, when you create them and you open up a macro, it automatically takes you to the macro screen for your character first as opposed to for everyone's macros first because I've also created a lot of macros for my druid that have just ended up in the everyone tab because I just didn't bother right. clicking yeah. over first. So <laughs> You're already yeah. there, so yeah, exactly. why not? Yep. All right, the realm consolidation update for Season of Discovery. This is basically saying, hey... Uh, they're going to be doing free character moves and they're going to be open uh, at 6 p.m. on uh, last Tuesday. They opened up on September 17th and they'll be live through uh, in preparation for this. We've disabled character creation entirely on the Crusader Strike and Wild Growth servers. This block will remain in effect until last Thursday, at which time character creation will be re-enabled. Okay, so they've, they've re-enabled character creation. So we're trying to create a character you were not able to create one previously, you are now able to again. But what the post sort of boils down to is they are moving down to only having two Season of Discovery servers. Uh, you are you are going to be on one of two realms. They're merging all the other realms together to those two realms. So we are going to be seeing that take place. Uh, basically, as part of this process, they're utilizing the name rec reclamation feature. This will automatically allow players to take the names that are otherwise on an inactive account um, they've set the date for inactivity beginning uh, of season four, phase four. So once any account that has not been logged into Vanilla WoW since July 11th will be eligible to lose any character names it has reserved if those names are requested by incoming uh, or new character creations. Please note customer service will not assist with game time requests or exceptions to this process. Interesting. Uh, we hope that this will give as many players as possible a chance to maintain names that they've grown attached to, but appreciate not everyone will be lucky, but ultimately we believe this is this consolidation will lead to the best experience for season discovery players. In other words, the population has been dropping off, which we've noticed, and as a result of that, they are doing character, well, not character, they're doing realm merges, which will make the world feel more popular, for more populated for everyone, and allow guilds to have more people to recruit with, more people to raid with, and hopefully that this ends up helping the population overall in the end. So expect those to be incoming. Yeah, I mean, like part of the issue with just the way Season of Discovery is, right? It's it's vanilla WoW. That's the point and the appeal of it. But it's got gameplay tweaks. But what it doesn't have is the tech tweaks that allow you to play cross realm and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, as as Season of Discovery rolls on, it's uh, I mean, we we were experiencing it back as early as phase two with just like and we were on uh, Wild Growth, which mm -hmm. is one of the, you know, mega realms, essentially. It's like it's just interest is low with with rounding out a group among our community and we just can't do it. Uh, you know, having bigger population should help with that. It's kind of essential to something like this succeeding. So. I guess in a way it was kind of inevitable. They're doing something kind of interesting with the Oceania servers because basically what they're doing is they're letting Oceania players uh, transfer to NA servers. I mean, it's the same region, right, in terms of the, the tech and, and hardware and the billing. Yeah. And, like, obviously your ping is going to go up if you're in Australia and you're playing on servers in North America. But they're, it's like a two-way move, so you can move back. If you really hate playing with like a 250 MS ping or whatever, Yeah. then you can move back. So, uh, you know, un unfortunately, the Oceania servers are sort of in this weird limbo between, because it's an NA, it's not its own region, but the region that it's in is nowhere geographically close to it, and you're just going to have latency over distance. So, you know, I, I think it's a decent compromise, at least. Like, hey, come try it. If you really hate it, you can move back. Um, but yeah, I... I, I'm not really surprised, I guess, that they, they went in this direction because you need a critical mass of players in yep. order for like the multiplayer parts of vanilla out of function. So yep. um, just keep it in mind, I guess, like if you if you haven't been playing SOD and you're interested 
in maybe playing picking it up for phase five or whatever just keep this in mind like you will be playing if you're in na you're going to be playing on on wild growth or crusader strike and um if you have a character you've had kind of sitting around and maybe you haven't played you might want to log in and just yep. you know save your name yeah keep your name there in case somebody coming over wants to you know maybe use the same name uh, just a psa on that but yeah it's um I don't know. I've, I've been getting like, I, I think they're doing some, some stuff with phase five that sounds really cool, but I'm just in a spot where I, I mean, I don't have time. How could I possibly find more wow time to devote to it? You know, yeah. And yeah, I'm with you. no matter how cool it sounds, I just don't think it's going to happen for me right now. Indeed. All right, folks, with that, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons. They contribute a ton to our show and help us to improve on the content we create. Today, I'm giving a special shout out to Alianas, Aragian, Bradley, Dustin, James, Kapawi, Max, Sauce Master 6000, Shorel, Rager, thank you so much for all that you give, as well as all of our patrons past and present. And a shout out to our newest patrons, Colby and Garrett. Thank you so much for hopping in and supporting the show. If you're wanting to hop in and support the show as well, you can go over to patreon.com slash the starting zone, or you can go to the starting and there's a patrons button you can click on that will take you to Patreon page for you. Uh, that was something that was recommended in our patron discord. If some people want to hop over and join our discord server, they can do that too. I'll tell you about that a little bit later in the show, uh, that thank you very much. Yes, it is now added on our actual main page, but thank you patrons past and present. You make the show. We'll show with like, oh, let's just continue. Like it would not be here without you all. It, it keeps the archives online. It pays for all the bills that we have associated with running the show and hosting the show and developing content for the show. Uh, for developing art for the show, all that stuff. It all comes out of the uh, the patron funds. So thank you so much for all of you who give and support the show. Absolutely, yes. It, it's helped us tremendously over the years and helped, you know, it's really helped keep the show stay on track in terms of production and, and you know, your ability to find and, and listen to it. So thank you, patrons, uh, and welcome uh, Colby and Garrett. Glad to have you aboard and thanks for supporting what we do around here. Yeah. All right. If you have enjoyed this episode of the starting zone, another way you can support the show is by heading over to your iTunes, your Apple podcast and leave us a five-star review. They really help out the show. They boost us up those charts and help more people find the show. And we love reading them here live. This one comes from aunt Raven quest, uh, in USA entitled incredibly consistent and informative show. I found this show towards the tail end of BFA and have been a listener since Jason and Spencer put together an excellent show every single week. They have a great format and it is easy to follow regardless of your level of play. Thank you so much, ONT or Aunt in Ravencrest. It is uh, it is certainly appreciated that you went out there and, and took the time to leave us the review. And I'm glad that you like the format and that it's helping you with the play. I, I know we have a lot more reviews as well that have been coming in. So we're going to get to those too. And I love having new ones every show. So please keep leaving them. They're great to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks on for taking the time to write in and let us know. And man, uh, tail end of BFA is still, that's actually a really long time ago, right? Like that's yeah. like four, four, four years, years now. I mean, somehow. I don't, I don't know how that yeah. happened, but yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But so thank you so much for, for checking in with us week in and week out. And thanks for taking the time to write in and, you know, glad we can help. Ho hopefully we're helping you navigate the, the landscape of what we're in here. We're still trying to kind of figure it out ourselves, but you yep. know, that's, I think it's part of the fun of the, of doing the show when we have new stuff is sort of just figuring it out. Like, okay, what, what did I do this week? And what, how did I feel about it? Or like, what, what did I do that felt like good or smart or mm -hmm. felt like I saved myself some time or something like that's, that's always what happens when we have a new expansion, you know, and we're diving into all these different things they put in. So that's it's it's fun to think about and, and talk about uh, you know amongst each other and then put it out there into the world and see what everybody thinks about it so yeah thanks for checking us out and thanks for writing in yeah, that's going to wrap up episode 650 of the starting zone if you want to go show notes for this episode or leave us a comment on the show you can head on over to the starting zone.com the official website for the starting zone podcast if you want to contact the show and leave us your feedback you can email us at the starting zone at starting zone at gmail.com or reach out to us on twitter at the starting zone or you can join our discord server at the starting zone.com slash discord. You can just go to the main page and click on the discord link. That'll take you there too. If you want to get your hands on some TSE gear, you can find that over at T public, which I should probably put a link on the site as well too. So I'll make sure that that's there. It is linked in all of our show posts, but I'll put one up on the main page as well. That's T E E public.com slash stores slash the starting zone, where you can find shirts and stickers and phone cases and that kind of stuff. And Jason, where can folks find you on the internet? 
the best place to find me, as always, is over on Twitter. You can find me over there at Shieldwald. And you can also find me on Blue Sky. It's just Jay Lucas over there for the username, so come check that out. Uh, you can find me streaming WoW over on twitch.tv slash Shieldwald and youtube.com slash Shieldwald. And I'll be streaming Raid Nights this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, 7.30 Eastern, getting into you know some more heroic prog and stuff. The Twitch drops are over, so if you failed to receive your ghost horse, then you have to go to eBay and spend fifteen hundred dollars on a loot card. Oh my God. Um, uh, and this, I think, this is the last week for uh, the pet for gifted subs. So I will be running that. If you want to come check out the Twitch channel, if you gift two subs to any uh, WoW streaming channel, then you get a pretty cool and rare pet. So uh, yeah, come say hi if you uh, are so inclined. If you're trying to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Spencer underscore Downey, or you can find me over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Spencer HD, or I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Spencer HD. And with that, for Jason and myself, we want to say thanks for listening, and jobs done.